Hi, everyone. I'm really excited to welcome Jeannie Yu here today because her work on colonial era natural history in the Dutch East Indies promises to resonate with scholars across Yale who are interested in Southeast Asia, the environmental humanities, human nature interactions, science and technology studies, colonial history, and more. Jeannie Yu is a PhD candidate in history at Princeton University and currently a short-term fellow at the John Cow Carter Brown Library. You can see from the background of that library in the background. Um, she's trained in early modern and modern history of Ireland, Southeast Asia, and works at the intersection of history of science, medicine, religious studies, and the history of the book. She's completing her dissertation, Mediating Islands, Ambon Across the Ages under the supervision of Michael Laffin and Keith Wailu. And she's also the author of a very powerful article called Wars and Wonders, the Inter-Island Information Networks of Georg Everhard Rumpfius, published in the British Journal for the History of Science, as well as numerous fascinating and well-written book reviews. Um, please join me in welcoming Jeannie Yu for today's talk, which is entitled Paper Chains from Fields to Archives, A View of the Information Economy in 18th century colonial Indonesia. Jeannie? Thank you so much, Eric. Um, and thank you to everyone who's attending today and to the Council on Southeast Asian Studies at Yale. And of course, to Chris Mosaker, who uh, helped to organize this um, since the summer. Um, today, I'll be presenting on a small part of the fourth chapter from my dissertation, um, which explores how cross-cultural exchange shaped European and indigenous knowledge formations about Ambon's natural world from the 17th to the 20th century. Um, and what I'll be presenting today takes us back to the 18th century. Let me share my... So paper chains from fields to archives, a view of the local information economy in 18th century colonial Indonesia. Asam Suleiman was not a man of quiet disposition or so the documents would have us believe. Suleiman's voice captured in translation came roaring across the pages of company records copied again and again in the 18th century. The year was 1705 a clear day in the month of May, the beginning of the year's dry season. Captain Lieutenant de Beveris, who had traveled to the northern province of Ambon for a council meeting, had no idea that what he was about to witness would make any kind of impact on future Dutch East India Company considerations. According to de Beveris, an uncommon commotion marked what was supposed to be a routine council meeting in one of the island's most lucrative provinces. Asam Suleiman, whose high status as Orangkaya guaranteed him a seat at the council, had protested vociferously against new company demands. The company was demanding that administrators lower the production of cloves on the island. This was partly in response to an intractable problem rankling the Dutch East India Company's high government in Batavia. Millions of pounds of stored cloves were rotting, and administrators could neither sell them for profit nor leave them to decay in the humid spaces of the city's cramped warehouses. One of the ways to keep this problem at bay, at least momentarily, was to reduce the total number of fresh cloves shipped from Ambon, where they were mainly produced, to Batavia and Java, the center of VOC operations in the East Indies. Soleiman was flabbergasted in hearing a demand so counterintuitive to company expectations for the past century, during which time the island's people had become economically dependent on the company's commerce and cloves. The Ambonese, Soleiman emphasized, had labored tirelessly for years to meet the demands of the company despite their, quote, suffering and neglect of their own trees but now the company wanted the very opposite. Exasperated, Soleiman was to have exclaimed, are we not now poor enough? What is so hard about letting them know of our condition? 
Just let them load the ships with ropes to strangle us. Then we shall deal with more of these cloves and then some. The island's administrators imputed some significance to Suleiman's retort. On the last day of May, 1705, the governor of Ambon, a man named Baltazar Coyet, sent a letter marked secret to administrators in Batavia. In it, he described news he had heard from the Beveris, who supposedly repeated Suleiman word for word in Dutch. Now, it is impossible to know if this was what Suleiman had actually said at the council meeting. If he was indeed protesting the decrease in the production of cloves, why would he say, then we shall deal with more of these cloves and then some? While there is reason for doubt, Coyet exuded confidence in its fidelity. He mentioned that the Beveris who witnessed and related this incident would soon testify to its veracity in person by quote, word of mouth, since he was already on a ship bound for Batavia. While this may sound somewhat dramatic, this was relatively speaking, a minor event in the history of Ambon. However, it was an important, it has a it has an important bureaucratic afterlife in the VOC Provincial Archive in Batavia. The contents of Koyet's letter would be extracted and copied in company reports, demonstrations, resolutions, and considerations. This was in part a coincidence, but it also happened at a time when the company was honing a complex system of information collection and retrieval through their active use of past documents from provincial archives. Just four years after the incident was recorded, a man by the name of Jon von Horn, a prominent administrator in Batavia who would soon become the VOC's governor general, extracted Suleiman's retort from Koyet's letter in full and included it in a signed demonstration to the high government. This was only the beginning. A chain of paperwork would carry Suleiman's words deep into the recesses of the company's provincial archive in Batavia, allowing them to resurface intermittently throughout the century. Van Horn's lengthy demonstration would be copied word for word into the book of general resolutions for that year. This rendered the incident and the quoted traces of Suleiman's words retrievable and extractable through the use of what would eventually be known as the Realia Repertorium, a working index of select marginalia from the high government's daily resolutions. Assam Suleiman's name would appear yet again in the latter half of the 18th century in a 1775 report about cultivating Banda's native nutmeg trees in Ambon. So 70 years after Koyet related it in a secret letter in 1705, Suleiman's words would be used in this report, but reinterpreted under vastly different circumstances. Since the 16th century, natural expeditions were one of the main sources of European information gathering in the East Indies. Expensive but valuable, such expeditions became a ubiquitous part of imperial activities in the early modern period producing a wealth of books, descriptions, drawings, and paintings about plants and animals, minerals and stones, people and their cultures. As many have argued, they conveyed information advantageous for global commerce, significant for scholarship, and useful for empires. In this respect, the 18th century was no different, marked as it was by voyages of global dimensions, the most famous of which were newly sponsored expeditions for the gathering of natural historical as well as ethnographic knowledge and specimens for trade and for scholarship. This presentation asks a slightly different question. After a century or more of collecting in the Dutch East Indies, how was past knowledge about the natural world retrieved? And how is it read as information having present economic value pertinent to global commerce. While explorers and administrators continued to undertake expeditions, others began to rely on their own provincial archives, reinterpreting the past in their present context of the 18th century to create considerations 
pertinent to their governance in the archipelago. There are three main questions I would like to address today. Inspired by this um, bureaucratic afterlife of Assam Suleiman's words. First, what were the archival strategies of VOC clerks who retrieved information from the past? In other words, how did administrators read to govern? Second, and more specifically, how did the act of extraction of past information from the archive affect colonial governance? And third, how might the history of the VOC's active use of imperial archives at the site of colonial governance help us to understand their attempt to sustain the political economy of the VOC during its rapid decline towards the end of the 18th century? The answers to these questions are, I believe, connected. And I am going to demonstrate it in two parts. First, I'm going to show how VOC clerks marginalists and archivists created and actively used a new system of information retrieval in the 18th century, a system which involved the use of a massive working index. Then I will address how retrieved information from past documents were integrated into new reports, which influenced administrative considerations about labor in particular towards the end of the 18th century a time when the company was completely drowning in debt, no longer fruitfully invested in inter-Asian trade and crippled by inter-imperial competition. VOC scribes understood that being able to retrieve information was just as important as collecting them. The retrieval of information about a specific thing from the company's vast archive proved to be a formidable task. This was because the company's daily logbooks and resolutions had been recorded and preserved by date. Chronology, in short, formed the organizational backbone of the archive, and written information lived under the shadow of concrete dates. In recognizing the need for a more efficient system of information retrieval, administrators in the 18th century began to create an alphabetical index of specific things and names, like cloves and letters, nutmegs and quicksilver. Over the course of the century, they compiled an overwhelming number of paratextual materials about real things and places from the company's handwritten tomes of general resolutions. As the company's collecting activities continued and papers accumulated, these indexes became a valuable tool, a guide for reaching back, not just into any past, but the past of material things. The first page of these handwritten indexes, still preserved in Jakarta, bore the title General Register of the Order of the Alphabet, in the Order of the Alphabet which in the 19th century was printed as one master index of three volumes in Leiden, titled Realia Repertorium. In organizing a system of information retrieval by way of an index, clerks were beholden to the extent marginalia that summarized the much lengthier passages in the body of the resolutions. Since each indexed item of marginalia was accompanied by a specific date, a clerk could have easily found the full resolution by looking up the pertinent day in the Book of General Resolutions for that year. Towards the end of the 18th century, most certainly in the years 1789 and 1790, a group of clerks in Batavia created a collection of extracted passages from resolutions dated between 1703 and 1719. The collection concerned one matter in particular, the prodigious rot of millions of pounds of cloves in Batavia's warehouses, which was partly why Asim Suleiman was asked to lower the production of cloves in Ambon back in 1705. Behind this history of how early 18th century administrators managed the city's vast amount of decaying waste, lies a history of how late 18th century VOC clerks were able to retrieve that information from an equally vast amount of paper. 
In this case, one can actually retrace how clerks retrieve past information from the index in its list of dated marginalia for cloves to original counts from the company's annual book of general resolutions out of which they created selected extracts. The clerk's names signed on every document they copied or checked were the only clues to the time of its collection. In other words, the date of the retrieval is not mentioned in these papers. Only the date pertaining to the index marginalia is noted. Here's an example. In the first two folios of the bundle I've been working with here on the left side of the slide, one finds a list of succinct descriptions, all numbered, dated, checked off, and all having to do with how the company attempted to reduce the presence of rotting cloves in the city. Upon closer inspection, it is clear that these descriptions are marginalia selected from the index and are at least similar to, if not an exact copy of, the marginalia found in the corresponding pages of the general resolutions. I'll take the first marginalia to show exactly what the clerk would have had to do with it. In 1789, a clerk by the name of Leonard Duriguzzi must have spent some time thumbing through the Book of General Resolutions from 1703. Dury Guzzi was one of 300 clerks working for the company that year, and his name was included in the annual name book of the company's sworn servants. Having received instructions to extract the resolution pertaining to the index marginalia, Dury Guzzi would have first scanned the top of the first 70 pages of the resolution's table of contents before finding the page numbers for the year 1703. Upon finding the month of June at the top of the page, he would have scanned its left margin for the specific date. And, and upon arriving at the 15th, he would have seen a brief list of marginalia about the day's proceedings. If he had bothered to peruse these at all, he might have learned that on June 15, 1703, Batavian administrators had discussed the shipments of sun-kissed silver and gold brought into Batavia from Bengal and the Coromandel coast. He might have also noticed that on the same distant day, a ship loaded with animals sailed for the city of Palembang, located on Sumatra's east coast, for the express purpose of hauling pepper. He would have also seen that 25,000 pounds of white pepper were loaded in a vessel bound for Holland. But as interesting as these snippets might have been, Dury Guzzi was solely charged with finding an entry to the marginalia about cloves. More specifically, he was looking for some clue as to how, quote, the mixing of moist and dry cloves had been found to be detrimental for this or Batavia's climate. To be sure, Dury Guzzi found that administrators in Batavia faced a problem with the cloves that had been stored in the city's warehouses. They had discussed this matter in relation to the ongoing exports of tree bark that were to be contrasted with the demand for spices from the Western sphere of the East Indies where Persian and Gujarati ships remained active. Having inspected the warehouse stocks, Administrators offered a reflection as to, quote, the concept of mixing the moist with the dry cloves, deciding that it would be best to separate them, given the local climate in Batavia. Moreover, presuming that the dry ones remained of quality, these were to be shipped separately for sale. Three Guzzi copied this passage from the resolutions. His own copy, an extract, was then approved and signed by the head clerk, Philippus de Elwike. Like other company clerks working under, El under de Elwike, Dury Guzzi signed his name on the bottom left corner of the document, ornately curling the first and last letters, but abbreviating his first name as, as was common practice. Now, suffice it to say that these clerks eventually found that between 1703 and 1719, administrators in Batavia tested various labor-intensive methods to rid the city of rotting cloves. First, forcing a group of people referred in some parts as arbiters, workers, and in other parts as slava or sla uh, slaves, to stuff millions of pounds of rotting cloves under the city's bulwarks 
to ultimately removing them years later, forcing the same group of people to ship them to nearby islands and dumping them in huge man-made holes nine feet underground. This process took around two decades. In the process of creating extracts, clerks actively decided on which passages to include from the body of the resolutions, which always had more information, more details of methods and accountings of figures than were ultimately included. The extracts would lead to copies of more selective fragments, which would then be weaved into other company reports, one genre of which was called the consideration. The consideration was one of many administrative genres which exuberantly referenced the papered past, replete with fragments of extracts of past resolutions using the index, as well as past letters, contemporary field reports, and handwritten extracts of printed books. And it did so in order to argue for new regulations. As I will show, 17th century expertise would be invoked, particularly when discussing matters of the natural world, its stakes for imperial commerce, and the necessary labor required to carry out the production of spices in the context of local colonial governance. In December 22, 1775, Batavian administrators Willem Breton and Hendrik Falkens signed their names on the last page of a completed consideration. They had drafted it over the course of one month since having received Rainier the Clerk's November field report regarding the present state of Ambon. The chain of these administrative reports concerned a problem that had a fraught, if not an obscure past the cultivation of nutmeg trees outside of their native Banda Islands. The clerk revealed that in his report that in fact, this was not the first time the company had felt the need to experiment with nutmeg cultivation on foreign soil. Using past letters and resolutions, he revealed that back in 1695, when a series of devastating earthquakes disrupted nutmeg and maize production in Banda, the high government had inquired about sustaining their production elsewhere, a question of enormous consequence, considering the company's century long efforts to monopolize these very spices in the Banda Islands for global commerce. Ultimately, after much back and forth, they settled for the island of Ambon, reasoning that the Ambonese people were more experienced in matters of plant cultivation, particularly of cloves. In 1775, Breton and Falkins would learn from this turn of the century experiment of nutmeg transplantation. The specialized knowledge of preparing nutmegs and mace from raw fruit parts to commercially valuable spices was not so easily transferable, not even among people from the same subset of islands in the same region. This short-lived but exhaustive experiment turned out to be a failure. By using the clerk's field report, along with extracts from books, treatises, correspondences, demonstrations, and resolutions, Breton and Falkins would learn from this history and come to make their own judgments on how best to execute this delicate operation in their present. What did they learn from um, extracts of 17th century ethnographic and natural historical writings was this. Nutmegs ripen twice a year in Banda. Their ripeness revealed itself through the natural splitting of the nut's wooden shell, which revealed the mace, so quote, clear red against a cool black of the nut's outer layers. In the morning, the enslaved people of the island's local overseers, who had direct relations with the VOC, would make their way up the mountain to the high altitudes where trees flourished in the mineral rich soil surrounding the island's active volcanoes. Arriving at the forest, they would spend their mornings and afternoons, quote, plucking. Looking up into the sky among the branches of the nutmeg trees, they would have seen the red mace in the crack of the hull, and these they knew were ripe for the plucking. They also picked the overripe fruit 
which had fallen to the ground overnight and would drop these into a separate basket. They knew not to confuse the fleshly plucked from the already fallen, as the two kinds were to be sold at different prices. Around five in the afternoon, they walked back down the mountain, each carrying heavily loaded baskets of the fruit, which had to be prepared into spices. This painstaking work involved cracking, unspooling, curing, and drying the fruit, a process which took in total at least 12 weeks. The extracted passages detail how in the evenings, the enslaved sharpened their knives to crack the hard, thick outer layer of the fruit completely open. The cracking proved to be a difficult process. They had to apply just the right amount of pressure to cut through the fruit's shell and flesh, but to leave the mace and nut intact. Based on the abstract, this procedure was considered dangerous. Sometimes, with a little too much pressure, the knife would slice all the way through, which not only left the nut and mace in pieces, but also, quote, did away with a slave's finger or two. The enslaved also used their hands to, quote, unspool the red mace from the nut, vein by vein. Furthermore, the 17th century method of drying nutmegs required the use of indigenous technologies, a complex infrastructure built solely for applying varying degrees of heat continuously for six weeks. Then came the caulking process. The enslaved would mix salt water with a type of caulk, creating a special liquid solution into, we, into which each dried nutmeg would be dipped three times. The skills, technologies, and knowledge needed to carry out this long and delicate process from the plucking and the cracking to the unspooling, drying, and the caulking were exactly what rendered the experiment of cultivating nutmegs outside of Banda so, quote, rare and difficult. As Breton and Falcons learned sitting in Batavia in 1775, back in 1699, administrators considered bringing to Ambon a number of, quote, Bandanese overseers and a few slaves who understood that work. The slaves, they wrote, would be able to impart in time the knowledge of how to handle the trees and fruit to the indigenous Ambonese people. But, they complained, even after having given enough courses and lessons, the Ambonese seem to have lost the, quote, will and diligence to carry out the work. They claim that compared to the slaves from Banda, the Ambonese were, quote, too lazy, proud, and useless to understand the special treatment and knowledge necessary for cultivating nutmegs. Such turn of the century comparisons between slaves from Banda and laborers in Ambon influenced Breton and Falcons in 1775, as they considered how best to gather enough manpower for the task at hand. The two administrators, however, were not entirely convinced that the Ambonese were simply, quote, lazy and useless. After all, they argue, it was the Ambonese who had been cultivating and preparing cloves for the company for more than a century. They were also unconvinced of the impossibility of imparting the skills and knowledge needed to cultivate and prepare nutmegs in what they called the Bandanese way. While they accepted these impressions and repeated them in their own report, they began to search for an explanation. And in their search, they came across the name Asam Suleiman, whose verbal retort against the company back in May 1705 left its own paper trail in Batavia's provincial archive. In 1709, four years after the recorded incident at the council meeting with which I began this presentation, Johan van Horn included an extract of the secret letter from Ambon in his own demonstration. Van Horn's main purpose for writing in 1709 was to use Soleiman as an example of what he deemed to be the declining character of the Ambonese, for which he blamed the company and its focus on commerce. It was what he called the avarice of company ministers which had tainted the local people with greed. <clears throat> 
Moreover, because of this, he continued, it would be difficult to force the Ambonese to do anything, quote, without offense or marked commotion. To provide evidence, he cited Soleiman's retort word for word from the original letter. Are we not now poor enough? What is so hard about letting them know of our condition? Just let them load the ships with ropes to strangle us. Then we shall deal with more of these clothes and then some. His demonstration would be copied in full into the high government's general resolutions for the year 1709. And through its insertion into the canon of resolutions, which clerks consulted throughout the 18th century using the index, as I have previously discussed, it would come to resurface in Breton and Falkins' own report. In their search for the labor needed to cultivate nutmegs and ambon, Breton and Falkins too came to focus on the influence of commerce on the character of the indigenous people. Echoing Van Horn, they claimed that the Ambonese had lacked, quote, European yearning, that is, the particular ethic of merchants whose sole goal was to make a profit. Such yearnings, however, were no longer linked to notions of greed, but to the ideal of productivity. Citing the resolution which included Von Horn's reference to the secret letter, Breton and Falkins quoted Soleiman's retort and recast this mediated information from the past in the 1775 report to suit the principles of the market economy. They recommended that in order to satisfy the Ambonese as a workforce, administrators would have to instill commercial incentives. The clerk had initially advised the administrators to pay the Ambonese, quote, with a gift of money, one that would be, quote, calculated according to the supply of the previous five years. Breton and Falcons vehemently disagreed. They believed that calculations based on the previous five years would not be satisfactory. This hinged on another assumption about how local people understood time and motivation as they, as they claimed that, quote, the indigenous sees in the present as much as in the future. Rather than paying them based on bundled calculations from the past then, they recommended that the company pay them based on a fixed amount per weight of production. For the two administrators, the successful cultivation of nutmegs had everything to do with instilling economic motives and that transferring knowledge hinged on increasing local people's incentives. Such on the ground considerations in thinking about knowledge, labor, money and incentives and controlling the labor force in the 18th century may perhaps explain why at a time when there was an acute shortage of VOC coins, the company would begin to print paper money, not only in Batavia, but also in Ambon, in both Dutch and in Malay, towards the end of the 18th century. The two administrators differed from their predecessors in key ways. While they agreed that 17th century methods of preparing the fruit into a spice was a delicate operation of extensive expertise and training, they disagreed about the impossibility of transferring such knowledge. For them, this was not a matter of character, but a matter of economic motive. Furthermore, they were keenly aware of the company's overwhelming reliance on Ambonis labor for the success of their project. This presentation has dipped into one or two key moments to assess how the emergence of an 18th century system of information retrieval within Batavia allowed officials to reach into the past in a manner unprecedented to devise on the ground solutions for specific problems. It is indeed an intensely local case of paper chains from a provincial archive in Batavia, but also of individuals whose voices are metaphorically chained to the papers, which would be replicated within the system. I outlined, it was this process of converting natural historical and ethnographic information into economically and commercially valuable information which would ultimately inform other reports that made their way up the chain from Batavia to Amsterdam as administrators in the provinces, as well as the metropole, deliberated on how to revive past cultivation and transplantation practices for their present dilemmas. In effect, these administrators became producers and reproducers of information 
that fed an ever-growing paper bureaucracy, lending ballast to a company which was, by the last half of the 18th century, drowning in debt and crippled by inter-imperial wars across the Indian Ocean. Through this process, information contained within various administrative writings came to have a protract protracted lifespan as they were recycled in extracts over the course of the century. I hope this shows the power of provincial archives for historical actors whose own prognostications were based on fragments of mediated information from a different time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeannie. Let's take a moment, uh, everyone, um, to reflect on this talk for a moment while you come up with questions. Um, we'll start the Q&A uh, in just a moment or so as people gather their thoughts. Um, that was a very rich and wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. Um, to the guests here, I will moderate the Q&A. Um, if you have a question, please use the hand raise function or turn your video on and wave your hand wildly and I'll probably see you that way too. Um, Michael, I see that you have, uh, you've turned your video on. Does that indicate an interest in asking a question? <clears throat> Absolutely. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, this fascinating talk. Um, you have published on Rumpheus. Who was, who was one of the great encyclopedic uh, compilers of information of, of the 17th century. So, so listening to you talk, I'm wondering if, if there's any evidence that, uh, that some of these VOC um, bureaucrats and, and, uh, and archivists referenced any of either any of his methods or his uh, his reports to Batavia or in the the 18th century his publications because of course on spice production he was per, for a time probably the 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 world's expert for, for that part of the world. Yeah, thank you so much, Michael, for the question. Um, I have indirect evidence that VOC administrators in Batavia were um, using information which Rumphius had collected back in the 17th century, mainly through um, their use of Francois Valentine's old and new East Indies. And as we know, Valentine was intimately connected to um, Rumphius and derived a lot of uh, his own writings about spices um, from Rumphius's works. Um, Rumphius's um, natural history, his herbal, wasn't published until the middle of the 18th century in Holland. And so and it wasn't, the print itself wasn't as famous until the 19th and 20th centuries when it would recirculate back to the islands um, to influence, you know, renewed bioprospecting activities in Ambon. Um, but for the 18th century, I don't have direct evidence of VOC clerks in Batavia using Rumphius's works. Um, they mainly cite Valentine, who at the time is much more, much more famous for his printed ethnography. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised if they were influenced by not Rumphius's natural histories, but his um, administrative papers, many of which he um, dictated and his scribe wrote down, and many of which had his signature. Um, at the end of the document. Um, so there was probably some influence from Rumphius, but um, not so much in the 18th century as I can see, mainly in the 19th and the 20th centuries, um, as well as the 17th century when he was reporting 
back to um, Batavia constantly. Thank you. Sure. While people collect their thoughts, um, I have a question. Um, as, as you were giving your talk, I couldn't help but think to myself that um, you're one more um, addition to the paper chain in a sense, right? Um, you're writing a dissertation about um, the way in which people are referring to other uh, texts and the text appear and they reappear, right? And in a sense, they reappear on your PowerPoint here as well. And so I wondered if you could tell us the difference and wh why, why does this period matter and why does this place matter um, specifically? So, you know, if you're doing, in some sense, you could argue that you're doing the same thing, but you are not in the same place and time. And so does the meaning change of the process or is it a kind of universal historical process that you're, you're hinting at, but then takes on a specific meaning in a particular place and time? And so I'm wondering if you could then reflect on how this is specific in a way to the 18th century and to Dutch colonialism you know, in, in this region and uh, then how that differentiates it to being a Princeton a scholar writing about it in the 21st century. <clears throat> no, Eric, thank you so much for that question. Yeah, it's, it's strange to kind of take a step back from the dissertation writing and to reflect on the fact that this kind of paper chain continues up to the present day. Um, and of course, there are clear parallels between the way that these VOC clerks uh, and administrators governing an empire um, use the archive to, to write about these islands, not only ethnographically, but historically and for policy and regulation purposes. Um, I think, you know, I see this process happening in multiple ways and I'll, I'll come back to like how I think of my, my role in all of this. The latest um, translator, for example, of Rumphius's um, herbal, Ian Bakeman, um, I recently found out was also kind of collaborating with a pharmaceutical company in the US. Right, and so that, like every kind of mediating process, whether that's collecting, documenting, translating, circulating similar information and in various versions has these on the ground in, impacts that um, I hope to kind of go into, into the present day um, for the book. But um, I think my role is, to kind of focus on um, the history of mediation and its influence in order to make us a little more, as historians, <laughs> self-reflexive about um, the craft we practice and um, how every kind of historical document that we're reading is buttressed by all kinds of mediating influences and elements of uncertainty. Um, so it's certainly been um, humbling, but at the same time, uh, I am very much aware that I, I too am repeating um, their words. And, you know, it's, um, I guess it's just one way of um, exploring, but also critiquing the way um, we narrate the past. So, yeah. Thank you for this very interesting. Uh, there's a lot to think about there. Um, there's a question. I don't know if you can see it in the chat. Can you see the chat bit window from Elizabeth Osborne? I can read it out loud. Or Elizabeth, if you would like to ask your question, you're you can unmute and do so. Okay, I'll do it, Elizabeth. I'll read it to you and that way everyone can see it. Um, it says, my apologies if this was covered at the beginning. Can you mention a bit more on the practice of slavery in Banda? Any sense of how many people enslaved and from where 
and whether intergenerational or time bound within the lifetime of an enslaved person. Yeah, so I can go into it a little bit, though I don't really specialize on the history of slavery in Banda. There are others, particularly in the Netherlands, who, who really uh, delve deeply into this. Um, there is some debate, I think, among historians about, you know, whether the practice of slavery in the Eastern archipelago is kind of a unique case in Asia where it's much more um, reminiscent of slavery in the Atlantic world or whether it's, it's um, kind of part of the, the uh, you know, a much more kind of a household slavery system which Anthony Reed writes about. Um, I, I don't really have much of a sense of which, which might be correct. But, um, you know, after the Banda massacre in the early 17th century, um, the local overseers were basically, the Dutch were brought in and um, were in charge of Bandanese slaves, but also other slaves who were brought into Banda from all over the archipelago. Um, and over time, by the end of the 17th century, which my talk um, kind of touched on, um, the overseers are no longer identified as European or Dutch, or even people who have like, um, uh, you know, Dutch blood. They're, they're much more seen as Bandanese at that point, because many of them Many of them had married um, locally, um, but the slaves are also um, considered Bandanese and sometimes they are identified ethnically um, as being from different parts of the archipelago. I mean, it's a really fascinating case of how um, identification based on ethnicity and based on the name of the island kind of comes into being in this part of the world where, of course, after the massacre, you have a great reduction of, of local people. But by the end of the century, you have this repopulation um, through force. Um, so I'm not sure if that answers your question, but it is, I believe, um, I think it is a life, you know, lifetime over the course of a person's lifetime that they they serve as slaves. But um, I would have to check that. Thanks. There's another question um, in the chat for someone with the uh, Tiano Reed has unstable Wi-Fi. So it says you mentioned at the beginning that you weren't sure if the original quote was spoken by Suleiman or that you had questions about its authenticity. Can you say more? And I'm wondering if he was specifically being recited and held up as some kind of quote unquote, genuine or authentic local voice. Yeah, I, I um, had someone ask me this question previously in a different uh, setting. And it's really unclear to me how it's possible to um, kind of cite Suleiman word for word in Dutch, mainly because we also don't know what language they were speaking in at the council meeting. So I'm not sure that it's a translation and also just substantively, it didn't make sense in the context that they were, they were in that the company was asking to reduce the number of cloves and yet Suleiman's retort suggests that, you know, he was being asked to deal with more clothes. Um, and so that's certainly in question. And I hope it was clear that like, I also think I have my doubts about, about this, but the important thing is that for the administrators who are working within this, in this um, system, it didn't really matter whether they thought it was true or not. They could provide evidence 
by sending somebody as witness to the event um, to Batavia and testify in person. Um, and of course, there, you know, the clerks and administrators were so incredibly meticulous to a point where, you know, as I'm tracing his words and multiple documents across the century, you know, there is no misspelling or changing of the actual quote. I mean, they're incredibly meticulous in writing it down in the same way. Um, it's just that the interpret, as if it's kind of frozen in time, right? And then the interpretations around the quote changes over time. Um, I, yeah, I mean, they're citing local, at, local indigenous people all the time. This is not something that's unique. Um, so I'm not, I, I don't, I don't really think that they were being recited as kind of a, an authentic indigenous voice, but more as evidence for different arguments at the time that they were writing. So of course, in 1709, as von Horn is, you know, citing Suleiman, he's using it to argue um, that the company had somehow tainted, you know, uh, local people's character. And then, you know, and it doesn't have much to do with authenticity, but that here is this evidence that this Ambonese person had changed. He is not compliant, right? Um, and of course, by 1775, they're citing him again, not to say that the company administrators tainted this man's character, but out of fear that people are not gonna be happy with um, you know, just a fixed price um, based on bundled calculations from uh, the, the cost and the cost of clothes from the previous five years. So it's kind of an evidence for how they think the indigenous people will react to certain policies. Um, but I don't think it's just about this kind of unique, authentic indigenous voice. Thank you. We have a question from Al Lim. Hi, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I'm not a historian, but I'm just curious about kind of the power relations and coming a bit more from like an anthropological side, uh, specifically with Batavia and the kind of relationship, um, the colonial relationship. So you're talking about the governor who wrote the letter to Batavia. I'm wondering kind of if you can speak a little more who is on the receiving end and thinking about how they, and, and in, in the talk type, um, right up, you talked about how there was a need to resolve their present dilemmas for what they believe to be a better future in this kind of paper chain. So I'm wondering who is the one kind of shaping this future? What future do they kind of imagine? Um, and, 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 and kind of like, who is the one kind of deciding that they need to trans, uh, convert this natural history knowledge into an, an economically valuable one? Um, and kind of like, who, who is on the other side, basically? Um, thank you. Yeah, so there's, thank you so much for that question. There's kind of a clear hierarchy within the company. And of course, administrators stationed in Batavia are much more powerful than administrators stationed in these other port cities like Ambon. Ambon actually becomes this weird training ground for, um, you know, to get a position as a high ranking administrator in Batavia. Um, but of course, within the kind of European company sphere, the clerks, the marginalists, and the archivists are also not, I mean, they're kind of low in the hierarchy. We don't really hear their voices. All we have are their signatures. Um, but they were part of the system um, of uh, using the archive to basically uh, collect information from the past for forming present resolutions. And of course, much of this is going on in Batavia, but this paper chain moves all the way from outer provinces like in 
outer provinces in Ambon to Batavia and from Batavia to Amsterdam. So ultimately all of these reports are being written for the governor general in, in Batavia, but also those in Amsterdam who are much more powerful than anyone stationed in these port cities. Um, and of course, like the people who, you know, are the least, just have no power within this process, um, I would say are kind of people like Assam Suleiman, right? Whose voices we think we hear, but we're left in doubt as to whether um, that was actually what he said, whether, you know, he's being interpreted in the right way. Um, and of course, you know, even when I talk about the knowledge of um, slaves from Banda, um, it's not as if we have, uh, you know, um, their, their voices in this. It's, it's much more about really collecting information, right, rather than, um, rather than kind of uh, in any way trying to revive uh, like their agency within these documents. And I'm, I'm a bit wary of, of doing that mainly because it's kind of like, who am I to, who am I to do it? But also um, it's interesting to see that um, by looking at the paper chains, one realizes that, I mean, I think I could have written this chapter in this paper just solely focusing on Assam Suleiman, about whom I have a little more information, which I didn't present today. But ultimately, it became a case of how the structure, which I've outlined here, of, of information being recycled in the archive, completely overpowering any kind of voice I can trace, which I've, I've tried really hard to do. So thank you for your question on, on power. It's, um, it's, it's everywhere um, and also kind of nowhere. So thank you. I'm gonna, I don't see any other questions, but I'm gonna ask one last question. Um, it's kind of a theoretical question, um, but you, you mentioned the word agency in, in the documents and, and you know, you're a little wary about it. And I was, pleasantly surprised in your talk how you didn't go down the pathway um, that's almost predictable nowadays when people talk about documents as, and the agency of the non-human of the document and all of these kinds of things which which is interesting theoretically in many ways but sometimes it departs from the actual material so much that you kind of lose the story a little bit but it does raise a question for me. I'm curious, like what you think about the kind of literature and things going on about the agency of documents and all that. You, surely you must be thinking about some of that a little bit as you write, but you have a, a unique approach to it, it seems. I wondered if you could articulate the way you think about those things. Yeah, no, thank you so much for this question. It's, it is something I'm considering but ultimately, I think my whole project is kind of based on the power of reading and the power of reading and interpreting and changing value in the information that people have collected and read in the past, um, which kind of goes into, you know, my writing about mediation that, you know, these documents don't, I, I, I think that it's really the people who are kind of behind the documents who have the most agency and yet are not exactly talked about in particularly in the context of the VOC. Um, so, you know, it's, yeah, I, I haven't really, mention the agency of archival documents so much as the agency of the clerks and the archivists who are actively um, compiling information and organizing that information. Um, 
And of course, along the way, the transformation that happens as they reinterpret or selectively extract um, shorter passages from longer resolutions. There, there are decisions being made that I don't think that historians have fully considered when they read their historical documents. Um, for example, the, the first part of my presentation, um, you know, the documents have the date of the extracts, which would be from like 1703 to 1715, but they don't have the date for when those extracts were collected. One would have to figure out the names of the clerks and then trace the names of the clerks in the VOC little name books in order to figure out when they were extracted and for what purposes. Um, and so I think that's a good case of showing that like, a lot of these uh, documents have been mediated over a very long period of time. And even within a very short period of time, if I talk about Rumphius, all of those documents have been mediated in certain ways, whether it's changing indigenous knowledge or using a scribe to uh, dictating and using a scribe to document certain information, copies of copies of copies, many of which are very different. And so um, I'm not sure that the object has as much um, power as uh, I would like to imbue them. I think it's really the people who are kind of invisible or have not been talked about or um, who are much more powerful. And I, I try to be honest about that, yeah interesting I was thinking a little bit about the system itself having a, a kind of compulsion to it as well though uh, for example when you mentioned that very important shift from listing by date and discovering that that conceals things or something and then the des desire to change it to an alphabetical system right but once you shift to an alphabetical system you have to fill in a through z right and eventually that itself generates a certain kind of process. Say you've finished A, well, then you're not done. You know you have to do B. And um, it creates a kind of like compulsion within itself that is quite interesting. But the initial process is started by a desire to shift, right? So it's quite interesting. Yeah, it's kind of, I found it really interesting that they didn't have the system in the 17th century, that it's something that started very much in the 18th century, the shift from, well, it's not com a complete shift because these resolutions are still being written by date. It's just that now they have this massive index to be able to organize that information. Um, but yeah, it's certainly um, kind of the way of thinking. And there isn't just one index. This is kind of a, a process um, that you know spans most of the 18th century. So there are multiple registers, which are then later compiled and printed in, in the 19th and the 20th centuries. So um, and you know, in the 19th century print edition, they will say, oh, this is for students who might be curious about <laughs> the history of the VOC. So students can actually use the index to search for, I guess, thesis topics or something. <laughs> um, and just to see if there are enough documents about that one topic. So it is definitely kind of a, a major shift in thinking about how to research the VOC's past. I think if we, there's no further questions, I'm gonna bring the, the talk to a close. Um, so I'll stop the recording now and I'll leave the the window open for a few more minutes for informal conversation after that. But please everyone join me in uh, thanking uh, Gina Yu for such a fascinating talk and wonderful Q&A. So thank you. <laughs>